Good morning. I'm Alan Cantor, a worship associate and member of this, the Unitarian Universalist Area Church at First Paris in Sherburne. Our opening words this morning from Carl Seberg. Let there be joy in our coming together this morning. Let there be truth heard in the words we speak and the songs we sing. Let there be help and healing for our disharmony and our despair. Let there be silence for the voice within us and beyond us. Let there be joy in our coming together. Thank you so much, Alan. Love your background, all the bicycles and multiple colors there. Good morning, everybody. So listen, I only have a couple announcements. One is we need some chalice lighters. So if you're just begging for the chance to show up on screen and light a beautiful chalice, just uh, go to the, the weekly email that Dara beautifully puts out every single week. And the link is there. Just put your name down. And if you just can't even bother to do that, just email me and tell me some dates you'd like to do it. And I'll put your name down because um, you don't want me to do keep doing the chalice. Um, and this morning, rather than have me do it, the marsh keys stepped in. So, uh, so please do sign up. We'd love to have you uh, be there. And um, that's really it. That's all the announcements we have. How, how fantastic is that? Um, so next we will just, uh, if you'd like to, to just uh, go into a little smaller breakout room to say good morning to somebody you know or don't know. And, uh, and then we'll begin our worship together. And look, Dara just put the chalice lighting link in the chat box for us. So bam, even better. In the waters, we are Alan Cantor and I will now share in our opening responsive words. Despite distance, we are connected. Despite loneliness, we are connected. And across different lives and lived experience, we are connected. In the presence of heartache and joy, we are connected. When we laugh, we are connected. And when we mourn, we are connected. Across a nation divided, we are connected. Even when we dance alone in a room, we are connected. In the heat of the sun, we are connected. In the glow of the stars, we are connected. Across the limits of our imagination, we are connected. Even when nature trembles, we are connected. Thanks, Alan. Our opening song this morning is one that I think everyone will recognize. Here comes the sun.
Just about the perfect lyrics for this morning. I'm watching there, Don and Carol Kaiser out in the sun, apropos for our song. This morning we spotlight the Marshkey family as they light our chalice and say together our covenant. Marshkeys. Happy birthday, Sarah. <laughs> Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek truth and love, and to help one another. And again, we offer a big shout out to our beloved Sarah DeVoe and happy birthday to her. It's her birthday morning. We are so blessed and grateful that uh, you are here, here with us and, and uh, here sharing your gift. Thank you so much, Sarah. <clears throat> so this morning, I was looking for a, uh, not this morning, but earlier this week, I was looking for a Wonderbox story and I couldn't find one that was really um, kind of hitting the moment or saying what I wanted it to say, knowing that we were gonna sing, Here Comes the Sun. So I asked um, my wife, Karen, who's an excellent artist, to help me with the story today. And so we did our own story. I did the words, the easy part. She did the pictures, the harder part. And so I'd invite anyone who's young in age or heart to come up close to the screen as we listen to the story that is called Lucy Lifts Up the Sun. And India is gonna share, show the cover page, first of all. And India's got it in uh, presenter mode, so just give her one sec, she's gonna try again. There we go. So this is Lucy, everybody. See the red pigtails? The reason that Karen put red pigtails is that she knows I had a nightmare years ago about a girl with uh, red pigtails that scared me to death. So that's, that's Karen just having a little fun with me. All right. So India, let's turn the next page. Here's Lucy in her bubble of aloneness in the winter in her room. And it's dark and, and you guys can see her uh, her smile or her lack of smile, her smile upside down, her frown, as she maybe sits on her shag carpet. And she's got, she's not feeling very good. She's got pandemic fatigue. And then she looks outside the window, India next page. And here she is still in the bubble and the calendar says March. This was like a couple of weeks ago and it was like 12 degrees on a Monday. I think that was even just this past Monday. And you see there's snowflakes outside the window and it's falling. And she's like, where is the sun? She heard the Beatles tune, but it hasn't come to fruition. Where's the sun? Lucy's not a happy camper. And so she begins to go outside looking for it. Is it under a rock there in the bottom? It's not under that. Is it in the garage? Nope, she's got her binoculars, by the way, you can see. Is it in the wheelbarrow? It's not in the wheelbarrow. Is it in the boot of a car? That's English for trunk. 
Is it underneath the slide? Nowhere is the sun. India, next page. So she opens up a map and she's trying to find the sun and she's looking everywhere for it. The sun though, in this time of year can be so shy. You can see her binoculars, she's looking everywhere. So the next thing Lucy does, she looks over towards the fence. Look at this. Look at the slats in the fence. You might even call them cracks, won't you? And there, poking at the very, very bottom, you can see it, everybody, right there in the bottom, the little rays, some light poking through. Lucy knows Leonard Cohen, of course, and she knows that there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. <laughs> so Lucy, what does Lucy do next? Well, she goes outside the gate and there she sees, she puts her binoculars down and she sees underneath the brush, everybody, this little tiny baby sun. It's so shy, you can see half of it's hidden. And she's wondering, can I talk to the sun? Well, let's see the next slide, see what she says. She says to the sun, do you need some help? Do you need some help getting up onto your feet? Everybody, oh my gosh, everybody in Massachusetts is just like aching to see you. You don't need to be shy. And so the next slide. It's been a long winter, says the sun. And like, I even need vitamin D, I think the sun is probably saying. Need some help getting onto my feet. Can you help me, the sun asked Lucy. So next slide. Lucy leans down picks up the sun underneath its baby ray arms, underneath its rays and lifts her up slowly, the way you would like a little baby. And slowly, slowly, Lucy lifts the sun above her head. Next slide. Up high above the fence, above the cracks, so that we all can see it. Next slide, Lucy says to the sun, look at you shine. We all need the light you have to share. As Lucy lays back on her deck chair with her virgin pina colada. Friends, may we have the spirit of Lucy looking for where the light is and helping the light find its place in us. So I invite us now for those the young ones who uh, need to kind of shake out their bodies uh, and go off and do something else with their, with their morning. And for whoever needs to be here to stay here and feel yourself in your own body. And take a deep breath in. And a deep breath out. And find yourself in yourself. As we gather in this moment for prayer and centering and meditation as we sing our song, or just listen to it if you'd like to, the tide is rising. It's rising and so on. 
Thank you so much, Sarah. We are all called to be here together in this moment, in this time, in this place. As we look into our beloved sanctuary and look at the candle flames, and I invite us to hold and lift up our prayers for loved ones. I begin this morning with our prayers for Dot Widmeyer's extended family, whose life we celebrated yesterday a beautiful hour of memory with her. And also my sister, Anna. And the reason I mentioned Anna is that she lives in Texas and she is a Vietnamese American. As we think of, as I think of Anna and all of our Asian American brothers and sisters and the racism against Asians and the violence this past week against the Asian community in Atlanta. Friends, please lift up your prayers for loved ones. My cycling teammate, Michael, who was injured yesterday in an accident on his bike. For Cole, who needs testing to better, better diagnose his epilepsy. For Uncle Matt, who's diagnosed with MS recently. For Thomas, 12, who has hurt his knee. For Jane, to truly see and support Ariel. For Catherine and Doug Taylor, whose mother, Liz Strong, died this week. For Uncle Nick and hopes he gets to heaven from Felix. Remembering Tommy Weaver, March 21st, 2010. He was 17. Oh, Tommy, we love you. For artists, for Melissa, if she struggles with depression. And for Rory and Sue and Miramar as they plan to flee to safety this week. Remembering my mom on her birthday. For mom and sister are both in the hospital for different reasons. Friends, for all of these names and so many more as they come in, we hold these souls and spirits in the light. We also lift up our prayers for the world. And this morning, my prayers and your prayers reach down to the southern border where so many Children who are alone await their next step seeking asylum. Welcome your prayers too for the world, my friends. For all Asian Americans to be comforted and sustained, for justice and a voice for those discriminated against, for the Natick farm. I'll hear about that in a moment for blessings for our Reggie and Anna to be safe as we recognize this rise in anti-Asian sentiments, for renewal and perseverance, for all the COVID patients and their medical carers. For more love and less anger. For all people who suffer from depression, anxiety, and other mental health struggles. Friends, for all of these prayers. And last but not least, on this beautiful morning here on the forming edge of spring, let us lift up together our gratitudes. for full-time work, for the possibility of spring invites, for spring, for gratitude for Sunday, for five-year-olds who love to jump in muddy puddles and maybe do their own laundry, for going back to school. I can't say it enough for vaccines, thankful for my new job, for neighbors, for our grandson, for collective resilience, for beautiful spring hike yesterday, for chickadees visiting our birdhouse, for Sam who just had her white coat ceremony, now starting clinical rotations tomorrow for a loving community, for the experience of a beautiful family gathering of family and friends, for clean air, for my dad's birthday, for our house, for bluebirds, 
friends, for all of these, all of these gratitudes, all of these loved ones, all of these prayers for the world, we hold all of them and we hold ourselves in the light this morning. Our prayer is to welcome the light. Our prayer is to put binoculars onto our souls like Lucy did and look for the sun in our life. To sing where we can and when we can and to whom we can, here comes the sun. For all of the feelings we have here on the forming edge of spring, we widen our arms. We lift our faces. And we say, Amen. Let us be held in several moments of stillness together. Thank you, Kathleen. Catherine McHugh will share our reading for today. Catherine. Thanks, Nathan. This poem is called The Joy Bringer by Thomas Lux. The joy bringer breaks the light through the oak leaves at dawn. The joy bringer injects the red birds red. The joy bringer brings the green lets the cup runneth over into a saucer from which you can sip. Gives the river the fish and the fish the river. If by two inches you avoid a piano falling on your head and then later at the hospital fall in love with the doctor who removes a few splinters of ivory 
and black piano lacquer from your left calf, the Joybringer arranged that. Also, the chilled artesian water spilling from a pipe only two inches above the ground from which you drank on your hands and knees on a few boards or branches. You bowed in the muck and drank that sweet cold reaching up. You drank among the skunk cabbage ferns, a small brook at your back. Again, guess what? The joy bringer. In fact, let us praise the joy bringer for these seven things. One, right lung. Two, left lung. Three, heart. Four, left brain. Five, right brain. Six, tongue. And seven, the body to put them in. Thank you, joy bringer. And thankee, thankee too, for just mown hay cut an inch from its roots to bleed its perfume into the air. Thank you, Catherine. Man, I love that poem. Catherine, maybe you can put the title in the chat box for us. People can search it out if they wanna see it again. So our offering this morning is gonna be introduced by Janie Holland. She's gonna talk about the Natick Community Organic Farm and what happened there this week and how we can help. Janie. Thank you, Nathan. Um, as many of you know, at 4.30 in the morning on March 17th, the Natick Community Organic Farm's historical 200-year-old barn went up in flames. Uh, Eddie, the farm dog, woke the caretakers, giving them time to call 911 and evacuate um, and get the firemen in before it had the uh, ability to spread further. So the barn and all the farm equipment and the pigs inside were lost to the fire and the community is really devastated. The barn was built in 1815 by the Bacon Brothers from local oak trees that were felled by a category four hurricane. The timbers and planks were milled on site in a watered power sawmill that stood across at the Bacon Brook. And through the 206 years, the community barn has served our community being many things to many people and many living creatures. It is a town owned nonprofit farm and it has served as the heart of South Natick and the surrounding areas. In 1975, the community provided a work program for local at risk teens. At that time, the barn was restored and it became a destination site where I took my boys as toddlers, as many of us did to see the animals, where my boys went to summer camp to learn to take care of animals harvest, package, and sell the produce at the farm stand. And as teens, they actually worked there as part of the work crew. My son Davis had done some carpentry repairs on that barn and built new animal pens. The, the, the farm provides year-round public programming, starting with Forest Gnomes Preschool, through adult workshops such as making maple syrup. During COVID, the farm helped feed Natick seniors and low-income residents that were hit by the virus, providing 10 Natick seniors with weekly senior-sized portions of organic vegetables, giving seniors access to fresh locally grown food that was delivered safely by the volunteers. Historically speaking, a barn building has always been a community event, one that involves everyone coming together to help raise the timbers and the walls. And we hope that we can count on this community to be part of the next barn raising. Thank you for any donations you can give. Thank you so very much, Janie. And also one of our members, Christine Schell, is the spouse of Marco Kaltoff and has worked there for the last um, seven years or so. Um, so uh, today's offering will be shared with the rebuilding effort, as Janie just described, a old fashioned barn raising. And like usual, we use our Realm platform to do that or to make any general donations. Thank you, friends, for your generosity. And thank you, Janie.
Friends, we offer our big, big, big thanks to Sarah DeVoe and to our choir. One of the hardest things I can tell you about um, speaking and singing into screens, and I know you all know this, is that you don't know the impact you have. You do, you, and they've recorded this during the week. So just raise your hands in appreciation or, or whatever it's got to do so that the singers know they reached you this morning. All right. So friends, here is the world and beautiful and joyful things will happen. Let us keep our hearts tender and our eyes soft and our words true because this is what you and I are about. We know there's no answer but to love each other. We bear witness against unnecessary destruction and we gather here in virtual community to practice being the people we are trying to be. We cannot do everything, but we can do something. And that's something that's never, 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 nothing. So let us ring the bell, the bells that still can ring and forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. And as Lucy can tell you that my friends, and you can say it with me is how the light gets in. So everybody, the first day of spring arrived yesterday, did it not? It was all blue, it was like today, it was like blue and bright and clear and proud. It was kind of even showing off. All the fair weather dog walkers were out on my street. Where have they been all winter when I was out there in the ice and snow and the wind and the cold? Well, I don't know, but they were out yesterday and the bunnies have launched their way underneath the deck triggering our dog's hunting reflex. He is still too slow to catch them. And maybe he doesn't even mean to because isn't the fun in the chase and the journey and not the catch and the arrival? And along with it, maybe you can feel it, the whole town, the whole neighborhood, the whole state, the whole country, the whole world is restless and impatient and in need of a good spring cleaning. There are open windows, there are open eyes. There are dust bunnies leaping out from everywhere, maybe even leaping out from you underneath the back deck of your spirit. After too little sun, after too much winter, after too much pandemic, and now, the equinox of spring is here, but there's also an equinox of something else. And it's something, it's, we haven't seen it in so long, it's hard to recognize it. It feels like the equinox of something like hope. But we need these binoculars to see it because it's been so far away. As vaccinations get rolled out, as plans for summer begin to happen, and we think about next year and cautiously, maybe even plan for something different after so many of our plans have been dashed and dialed back and derailed and interrupted and changed. Giving us all just for this moment, this year, this moment, this permission to plan ahead, to look ahead, to live ahead, to hope ahead, maybe even yes, to joy ahead. Joy, you knew this was coming. It comes from the French. <laughs> Joie, I'm bad at French, obviously. Joie de vivre, the exuberant joy of life. Joie de vivre, so much more than pleasure, which is temporary and transient. Pleasure is like a uh, Netflix series that has a limited number of episodes. It's short, it's time bound. But joy persists. It gets always renewed for another season. It persists through pandemic and through despair, past all and every equinox. Why? Because joy 
is not a mood. It's a movement. Joy is not a virtue. It's a verb. Cornell West said that. I need to explain. Earlier this week, Betty Glick, who just sang in our choir for us, upon seeing the word joy in my sermon title, which over my whole career doesn't happen that often, and I think this last year hasn't happened at all, sent me, uh, Betty sent me a reminder about scripture. See, Unitarian Universalists know their Bible too. And the scripture she sent me was from the Psalms, which is some of the oldest and most beautiful poetry you're ever going to read. And the verse she sent me was this. Weeping may tarry in the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Weeping may tarry in the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And when Betty sent that to me, I finally felt like I had found the words to describe how I feel. Maybe you do too. We who have, um, you and I, who have been living in such a long night together. We're asking, when is it going to be done? When are the clocks going to spring forward? When is Lucy going to finally find the sun behind the fence? I was talking to my therapist um, a few weeks ago, and I mentioned this fact so that taking care of our mental health is not something that gets um, hidden away, that gets um, stigmatized, but rather gets normalized. Anyway, I was talking with him. And as I was recounting how I had gone to see Dot Widmeyer, whose life we celebrated yesterday, how I'd gone to see her for a final time, and how her loss came after um, Betty Douse this past fall, and then Tom Belote, who was a newer member to our community, and then, of course, Maria Salomea Schmidt, who was only 53 when she died. My therapist pointed out to me, he said, Nathan, it seems like the only person, the only people you have actually seen in person since September from your church community are those who are about to die. It took my breath away. It took my breath away having that realization. And it explained it explained in a moment so much about the sadness that has worn down through me the way that water cuts a valley. And it explains why, despite all of the distractions and like the good Netflix shows and the occasional takeout and feeling, you know, ha happy enough or whatever that, whatever, like, you know, feeling fine, whatever that feeling is, how despite all of that, I have never really, this last year, I think, woken up to the morning, um, woken up from the morning, morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. I've never really woken up yet to the cometh of joy. Now that's, that's quite a realization, everybody. Maybe this is true for you. Maybe just now, maybe just now in hearing that for the first time, you haven't realized it. It's only now in my saying it out loud, the way that my therapist said it for me, that, you've, that you're noticing that. 
So permission granted to feel what you're gonna feel. I know some of you, I, you're, like, you're like me. Please don't put joy on the to-do list of something now you gotta try to figure out how to perfect or achieve. Put away your notepad and just feel for a second. That's what I did. And I was um, a few days ago, I was driving around um, in the car to going to get coffee. It's like this new routine. It's like an outing, you know? And I heard on the radio, Susanna Heschel, who's the daughter of Abraham Joshua Heschel, rabbi, who himself, of course, barely escaped the Gestapo and the Holocaust. And Susanna shared, she's a professor of Jewish thought. She shared how in Jewish theology, what despair means is that God is not present. What despair is, is that God is absent. And then she said something that almost made me stop the car. She said, how life cracks us sometimes and sometimes even tries to break us, she said. And what despair is, is when we can't see the light, we can't see the light, we can't see the light of God that might come through the cracks because we're screened out from the light, the light somehow. We're like, we're wrapped over it. We can't see our eyes. We have shades over our faces and we can't see them. And what it sounds like, it sounds like this, is what it sounds like, what despair sounds like is we give up. We say this pandemic is going to last forever. We say we're never going to be back together in the sanctuary again. We say we resign ourselves to, way, to the way things are. That's what despair sounds like. We resign ourselves to crises everywhere. We resign ourselves to broken democracy, to racism out in the open, to yet another shooting. And despair, what despair looks like is that emoji you might have in some of your on your phones. It just is like, eh, it's just a shrug. It's like, it's just gonna happen. What can I do? You've seen the shrug, you've seen the emoji. What can I do? I can't do anything. Despair is forever night. It's 24 hours of darkness. Despair is forever distant dawn. Despair is giving up. Despair is resignation. You're thinking, I thought this was supposed to be a sermon about joy. What the hell? <laughs> ah, yes, right? Joy, joie de vivre, the exuberant joy of life. But here's the thing about joy, everybody that I've been learning about myself. Joy is not some fuzzy, happy feeling. It's not a nice feeling that you have. It's not a mood. Check this out. It's from the Psalms. It's from MLK. It's from Cornell West. All of these people say this about joy. Joy is not a feeling. Joy is the act of resistance. and persistence. Joy is saying we're going to we're going to fight stuff. But as Cornell West said that I heard him on the radio, he said we're going to fight stuff, but we're going to have a good time. Oh yeah, we're going to have a good time. Joy is acknowledging the valley in myself. It's acknowledging the night. It's looking at the night, looking at the valley. It's, it's pretending, it's not pretending that the valley isn't real. But then, and this is key, what joy is, what joy is, is it asks us, you're in the valley now, what's going to lift you up? What's going to lift you up? Who lifts you up? Who in your life lifts you up? out of the valley. That's joy.
like Lucy did with the son, who, when your joy is shy and in the brush behind the fence, who in your life lifts their arms underneath, underneath your arms and lifts you up like a baby and holds you higher? My friends, joy means um, resistance to being numb. Okay? It, it means that we know that God gives us inspiration all the time. That's what I believe. And what joy means is that we look around and we ask how we get inspired. I want you to pay attention to the ways in which you have seen things this week. Maybe the, the like in me, when I you know, saw what happened in Atlanta and I called my sister right away and I was angry. You notice the protest and the fight that you have in you? You notice the, the feeling you have to be moved? You notice the, 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 the sense that you're not gonna just allow things to happen the way that they've happened these last years? Do you feel inspired to act? What I want to tell you is that that inspiration is joy. It's telling you that life is worth living. It's the exuberant joie de vivre of prophetic witness against the world. Are you watching your kid on screens all day? Are you just like amazed at them? How they just get on with it? How they have grit? That's joy in you when you see them persist and resist and keep trying. And you know what? I'm thinking to the sorrowful Nathan, the sad Nathan in the valley, all these people that I've had to be with, literally some, some of them literally at their last breath this year, this, this winter. You know what joy says to me and to all of our losses this year? It says we, um, we, we miss them. But joy says, oh, how we have been blessed by these people and their lives. These souls who make us and shape us and inspire us and create us and fed us and shown us the light. Joy reminds us of how the lives that we have lost and we have loved are still a blessing. That's what joy does. Joy means that we title our memorial services, not a memorial service. We, joy says we call them a celebration of life, a joie de vivre, of memory. This is joy. I want you to ask what you can still save this year, what you can still rescue, what you can still savor. I want you to ask who you can make more whole. I want you to ask how you can be made more whole because those questions are the questions of resistance. They are the questions of joy. It means that you will look at the world and you will acknowledge the darkness and you say, joy says to you, and you say back to me, I love it anyway. I'm going to hope anyway. And the last thing I want to tell you is, if you don't have any of this this morning, if you're like Lucy back in that bubble with that frown, because that is real. This isn't just like a sad thought, that's real. We are all there and have been there and know people who have been there this whole time. And what I wanna tell you and tell those of you who are still in that place, and I am sometimes I can tell you, when despair wakes you in the night and you still see the dawn is nowhere coming close, that is why 
we have community because what community does, what community does is that we hold joy for you until you can hold it yourself. That's what, look, that's what religion does. That's what community does. It's because we are exhausted from being alone and we need other people to hold hope and hold joy for us. So friends, as long as there is resistance in you, there is joy. As long as there is inspiration in you, there is joy. As long as you aren't numb to a beautiful day that awaits you the rest of the afternoon, and you aren't numb to everyone and everything around you, to little pockets of beauty and little rays of light, then there is joy in you. So I want you to send me and yourself joie de vivre. Send it to each other. Send your exuberant joy of living. Send it out because we need it. The night is here still, but the morning cometh, I believe. So let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Love you guys. In our closing hymn. like Lucy, each of us today, let us go back behind the gate of whatever the gate might be and see the sun that's down below that is the joy that might be buried in the brush of whatever part of your life that you might be searching for. And I want us to lift up that joy this morning and today. Lift it up and let it not, let it not be shy, my friends, and lift it up high above you so that the rest of us can see it. Joie de vivre, joie de vivre, exuberant joy of life. As we say our call to ministry, we go forth into the world in peace to act with works of love, to affirm each person's dignity and to cherish the living earth. Amen. <laughs>